Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another fresh episode of B2B Breakfast to Business, where we talk shop, we talk life, we talk advocacy, and we talk real. This is your morning girl, Bail, the Managing Director of Team Asia, bringing you this episode with a lot of great insight and super exciting conversation up ahead. Now, for our topic of the day, ladies and gentlemen, is really going into a reflection on the past two years of ushering in changes and paving our new normal. Now, we've been already talking about this for years, actually, that the pandemic has really transformed every company's ways of working. Everyone was forced to stay in their homes and to do business as usual, which actually led us all to call remote working and hybrid operations our quote and unquote new normal. Now, as we reflected on this particular journey, one question actually kept on you know, coming up. And that is, have we actually really determined the pathway to the future of work? Now, that's a really interesting question. And so we dug a little bit deep into that one and we um, looked into this special journey. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. For Capital One Philippines, no one knows the pathway to the future of work, but they do listen. They are ready to observe and converse with industry leaders and experts to slowly pave the way and see where the future of work really is. And I'm very excited to be discussing this with everybody today as we serve you with the latest Breakfast to Business episode. And we have such an inspiring and very special guest today who will dive deep into this pathways to the future of work. And I am very honored to be welcoming JP Paperman, Capital One Philippines Head of Operations to the B2B Airwaves. Now, JP was appointed to become Capital One Philippines Head of Operations along with the company's now president, Oz Pervais. He has 20 years of experience in the financial services industry, working at Discover Financial Services, JP Morgan Chase, and Capital One. As the head of operations for Capital One Philippines, JP is responsible for the day-to-day operations of the company, ensuring that all associates maintain productivity remotely while still having awesome and very special quality time with their loved ones outside of work. He is very passionate about this topic, and I am sure that we're going to have a great breakfast conversation. So without further ado, let us all welcome JP Paperman to the B2B Airwaves. Hi, JP. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, I'm doing well. I was excited coming into the conversation after that setup. I'm even more pumped and and happy to be here and uh, looking forward to uh, some of the back and forth on what's a, a really great topic. Me too, JP. Um, I've been waiting for this and I can't wait to talk about it a little bit more. But before all that, JP, I just wanted to check in. You know, we had Capital One Philippines in the B2B airwaves, you know, um, uh, last year. And we wanted to check in. How has Capital One Philippines been? What are the new and exciting things that are happening over there? Would love to catch up on that first. Yeah, my immediate reaction is that that quote, what a difference a year makes. Um, and that's particularly true right now, because there's been a lot of excitement and change, I think, over the last you know 12 months. So I think, honestly, what's been particularly exciting most recently is not a return to normal, which is something I think maybe was a life goal two years ago. But now we're getting this up close and personal introduction to what you referenced, our, our new normal. And we're starting to live it and see that even to a fuller extent. Uh, which is really cool. We're, we're get to see now an integration of some of our, our favorite activities from the past, the pre-pandemic life, now intertwined with our new radical hybrid operating model, um, which is cool. So whether it be hosting site visitors for the first time in a number of years, but with a, a totally different agenda and flavor to just being able to recognize uh, top associates and celebrate in person outside of Zoom once again, um, there's a lot going on. And, and I, I don't think we could be ending the year on a higher note right now. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, JP. I love the word that you used earlier, which is an integration. Um, I, I think that this is the first time that I'm hearing it when we say we're paving this new path to the new normal, but we're integrating things from our past, but also 
creating and experimenting new things that would really work. So it's more of like an integration of what works for us, right? And what makes sense for today. Thank you for sharing that, JP. Now, on that note, I'm very curious and excited to talk about Capital One's journey. Um, like what you said, in the past 12 months, what a year um, uh, it has been, and so many of the different changes. And I know that Capital One has been actually on an amazing journey towards finding out this new pathway to the future of work. Could you delve deeper into that one? What is this journey all about? And why do you call it pathway to the future of work? Yeah, so our, our journey has been one, Bea, that I think has been anchored to a commitment to the fundamental art and science of learning. I think that is the path forward. And we don't know what the future holds, but I think we know some of the, the tools we need to equip ourselves in order to navigate the, the uncertainty ahead. Um, I love, there's a quote by Robert Persig that I think about pretty regularly. It, it, it says, the real purpose of the scientific method is to make sure nature hasn't misled you into thinking you know something you don't actually know. Um, and that one, I think we we keep close to the vest as well, too, as, as it informs and influences, I think, how we approach building for, for all the gray space ahead of us. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the journey um, to your question itself. And and while I would love to say that all the learning and discovery came easily with nothing but success, the reality is a lot of what we learned came from maybe where we were misaligned. And after seeing firsthand the impacts of, of underestimating the need to adjust when the pandemic hit, having been one of the later adopters to work at home, we've now been able to incorporate the lessons learned from both failure and then now some of the successes that came from what I like to call educated guesses, because again, nobody really knows what the future is. Um, then, you know, a lot of the, the educated guesses that we ended up getting right. And, and now we're taking the goodness from both and, and incorporating them into our, our longer term operating model, which I think is, is always the goal. Um, now, to go from where we were to where we now are, which is a great place on our journey and our transition, um, it started with us just so, so for those who wouldn't know, with us needing to deploy work at home with great urgency, like so many did. Um, although we did it at a time as the impacts of Delta were actually rearing their ugly head. And, and while we were still on site um, predominantly throughout that wave, which was particularly challenging, um, and it made it clear that ever that work at home was was now a necessity, not even an option or a choice. So what was really exciting, Bea, we, we expected that we'd see some, some pretty solid results and impacts, but what we ended up experiencing was nothing short of what we would call a remarkable turnaround with regard to just about every measurement and operation of our size and scale would measure and treasure. So the, the famine, the feast results were so remarkable that as a part of our journey, it brought us to the realization that the risk and reward proposition in determining the long-term operating model was too great to rush into a decision and, and risk getting wrong again. So in recognition of the lingering uncertainty that we expected would be present throughout 2022 and, and certainly was ended up being true, we made a deliberate decision to pause on building and instead just focused on, on learning before we actually laid any concrete for the, the path of the future. So through that lens, and we'll talk about it, I imagine a little bit more in detail, but we worked with McKinsey Consulting to develop, I think, what was the most comprehensive review of our industry and local labor market sentiment at the time, beyond even the circumstances of the pandemic, as a lot of the studies up to that point had kind of focused and anchored to. Um, and we also plugged into more, I think, industry leaders and, and forums as well, too, to help ensure that we are developing a future where our market would continue to thrive on the global stage as well, while simultaneously, I think, reprioritizing how we listen to our associates more than ever, as I think it's obvious when I say this, but I'd be remiss not to, we wouldn't be successful without their personal and professional experiences, successes, and preferences as well. So all of that emphasis, and I'm glad we paused and, and took the time to, to learn before we moved into that next chapter. Because what ended up happening from that, the result for our journey was a clearer picture on the priorities of our labor market, both at Capital One and, of course, in the labor market we serve, the ITBPM industry here in the Philippines, um, along with an understanding of, of the other critical areas of operations we would need to revisit in order to unlock the, the full potential of a hybrid operating model. On one side, there's this element of, like, hey, let's, let's mitigate risk uh, and not get it wrong. And then there's this other component of, like, and how do we thrive in a new operating model? How do we go on offense and make the most of it? So. You know, just to, to kind of wrap it up, we've since made that commitment to emphasizing optionality, continuing to assess labor market sentiment along with the evolving industry needs, just to make sure that we can course correct over the next few years versus the risk of building an inflexible model that won't change with the times. Um, and that's particularly important because I don't know that I'm alone in saying this, but I'm of the belief that the future of work is an incredible and an exciting story 
Um, but I think that we'll see that it's going to continue to be written for a few more years at least. I think the next chapter, Bea, um, and maybe a future um, breakfast to business uh, topic is may even be titled The Great Divide, as I think we'll start to see the labor market choose who gets it right, maybe who missed the mark. However, I think that will also operate as the next catalyst for our entire industry to adjust and take the next step forward. So here we are today, wrapping the year on incredibly high notes. There's some exciting momentum going into 2023 as a result of our 2022 journey, uh, but we'll continue to carry our, our humility from our misses as well in the past. Um, forward with us to ensure that our, our journey remains one with objectivity and, and open minds on the discovery. That's awesome. Such an amazing journey and story. JP, in fact, I was writing all of my notes already and I was learning so much from um, you know what you've shared already. One of the things that I really loved and resonated with with what you said is we had to pause on building and focus on the learning what the pathway to work is, because you're right. I mean, the future of work is something that will be continuously written. And I can just imagine that as you write that chapter, that chapter will really evolve and evolve and evolve, probably a lot of different edits, right? And I love that we already have a next chapter conversation, JP. So I'll just have to have you back, <laughs> you know, after a couple of, um, uh, you know, periods or chapters to talk about the great divide as you you mentioned. So really appreciate you um, going through the journey of Capital One Philippines, JP, in terms of really, you know, imbibing this new normal or the work at home setup. There were three things that you actually shared, JP, that I really wanted to, to look into because I feel that those were your inspiration points or inspiration starters, right? Um, as you guys built this or learn the pathways to work. You mentioned that you work with McKinsey on a study. You also talked to a lot of industry leaders and you also really looked into how you could speak more or listen more to your associates to be able to really get that pathway to work framework um, down pat. So I wanted to just break that down a little bit. Could you talk more about the McKinsey study that you guys did, JP, and how was this study really helpful in coming up with a building block, so to speak, for the pathway to the future of work? Yeah, it's, you know, I give a lot of credit to our president, Oz Parvez, who really pushes and reminds us to, you know, assume, start by assuming that there's an answer out there, but it's most likely not in our heads. And I think that's a great push to have because, you know, in the process of seeking other perspectives, you know, best case scenario is you'll validate that you had a great idea from the start and you feel more confident going forward. Uh, but I think equally as beneficial is, is you'll find a different perspective that all of a sudden something clicks and you say, wow, I hadn't considered that. And now I'm more confident than ever in whatever my next educated guess is going forward. Um, the McKinsey partnership in particular, you know, we spent time with them and, and I think they were really excited when we, we first pulled up with them because we told them, Hey, no pressure, but we are like, we're going to actually wait before we build for the future until we really get to hear what's going on in the industry across the globe. What are the unique preferences of the labor market here in the Philippines? And what are our people telling us? We want to ensure that we fully understand like what are the most critical components of, of their ability to be successful and thrive. And by the way, success isn't determined by any one metric on a scorecard, but I think more importantly, like this broader picture, and I'll go back to that word integration of work and, and life and coexisting as well too, to, to really thrive. And so, you know, we shared with them that we're remaining entirely open. Um, we're not looking for validation so much as we are, um, I think that the different perspectives. And, and so through that lens, I think they were really excited at, at just the, the open-minded approach that we were taking into it. And so, um, they worked with a lot of different local industry leaders here. There was a number of surveys. We pulled close to 4,000 individuals, not counting all of the focus groups and, and other industry views from competitors and similar minded and operating organizations as well, too, to create this, this really deep understanding of, of what the future of the labor market is, is really looking for and expecting in their work experience. And um, I think that was particularly critical because um, one, of course, there were some areas where we said, yeah, that kind of validates what some of our assumptions were. We knew that work at home, as an example, um, was an important component. But I think we may have even underestimated just how critical that really is. And I think we've talked about, we've seen, a lot of us have seen studies that show there's a little bit of a disconnect at times between maybe what the most senior leaders and organizations believe the employees are looking for in the future of work versus what the employees actually really seek. And I think this helped reduce the risk that we would end up um, being misaligned. And, and ultimately, as we continue to remind ourselves, 
at the end of the day, the labor market will always win. And the first to figure out where they're heading, um, have a competitive advantage to be there um, waiting for them when they arrive. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, JP. Were there some challenges that you act that came up actually in that study that you felt, okay, these are the things that we need to prepare for or that we need to work towards? Yeah, there were point in time challenges that I think have since been answered. And I think there are also a number of challenges that will also continue to be pretty fluid and evolve, I think, in the, in the next coming years. So I think some of them were just certainly with regard to, you know, here in the Philippines, it was a year of transition as well, too. Um, heading into the election, you know, a lot of questions about, you know, support for the industry, support for work at home and, and more. So I think even as we saw what the labor market wanted, we saw a risk of misalignment between what we were able to support and maybe some of the trade-offs that were involved and in going in any number of directions as well, too. Since then, I think we've been really thrilled with, I think, the progress made. And I feel like there's as, as great a support as ever within the industry and, and couldn't be more excited about what that looks like from a macro perspective going forward here. Um, but there's also some components that are unsolved. And I think I'm more invigorated and enthusiastic about uh, challenging myself and the team to, to be ahead and figure out what they are. And like one example is, you know, we, we know what the uh, associate sentiment is, you know, this, this work-life integration and the ability to, I think, have the optionality to choose where they'll do their best work on any given day. It's very clear. What wasn't as clear and still today we're going to figure out is like, what does the, the future of, of leadership look like as well, too? How do you go from, you know, individuals who really were very used to, you know, being immersed physically in the environment and being able to leverage what they see as um, a way to inform their, their next steps and priorities to shifting to this, this virtual environment and, and, and really maximizing the tools that we have, which are different, but certainly not any less powerful as well, too, and helping you know, individuals thrive and evolve um, in their journey as well, too. Let's not forget about the challenges that exist there. So we can talk about the role of the leader. I think we also saw the challenge of understanding the role of the building, too, um, is going to be something that uh, we think we have a lot of good insights into. But again, the future will tell us uh, pretty soon as well. So uh, we're still, I think, kind of navigating through a number of different areas, as many of the organizations are within our market. Absolutely. And JP, may I just share that your energy is so amazing. I am so excited actually for you. I love the term that you use, invigorated. And I could really feel that, that, you know, I think that the next step actually in writing this new chapter is us being able to challenge ourselves to keep pushing forward and really seeing, okay, these are the challenges that we are answering now, but these challenges can evolve and we can be hit by other opportunities and challenges that we must face that we must you know come up with solutions for but more importantly make it work for us right that's that's the goal that we have here speaking of um, goals and and the like jp you also mentioned earlier that aside from mckinsey you've also spoken very openly with other industry leaders as well and really listened to what was happening in the market um, as well as listening to your associates how was that exercise very helpful in building this framework of Capital One Philippines? Oh, that I don't know that we'd be where we are today without the, the help and the willingness for other industry leaders to be transparent with their approach, which include not only their successes, but likewise, some of their fears and, and questions as well, too. It just forces you, I think, to be even more detailed in, in understanding the why behind everything you're, you're doing or about to do as well. So I think, you know, we went into this desire to get more connected within the industry um, with this frame of mind that Nobody has the answer, as we mentioned before. So whether we're calling it an experiment or not, we're, we're really testing and learning our way with pilots in all these different organizations. And, you know, there's a really powerful discussion I can remember with a couple of very bright, um, very experienced leaders where, you know, we went and had some lunch. And, and as we try to predict what 2022 would hold for us, what we found is we all had very different views on what the role of the building would play going forward the desire for individuals to come back or not and why they would or wouldn't as well too. And, you know, walking away from there, that was, again, I'll use the word invigorating once more because rather than being discouraged by the fact that, you know, we all had different perspectives, instead it shared, it just it heightened, added, um, added emphasis on the role that we have as leaders and how important it is to, you know, as representatives of this broader market, work with each other to ensure that, again, you know, we, we win as a collective Philippines ITBPM industry as well. So through that process, you get to build some new relationships. You get to learn from folks who were able to give us as kind of new joiners to the work at home space, 
some really reasonable warnings and call outs that we could mitigate in advance. And, and they did inform our strategy and I think helped us while at the same time sharing our perspectives. And I think we, we actually um, all along when we developed the McKinsey um, survey of our uh, sentiment, the intent was never to keep that for us at Capital One as a competitive advantage, but we've been sharing that prominently with other leaders to help ensure that again, at the end of the day, we have a collective win for, for all of our, our labor market as well too. So it's been one of, I think, enablement for all of us, appropriate challenge. And then I think it's built some camaraderie and connection um, across a number of different industries as at the end of the day, uh, we all want to ensure that, that we end up here locally, I think, building something that was even better than it was heading into the pandemic. Absolutely. And one of the things that um, uh, kept on coming back to me, actually, JP, as you were sharing this, really, is the collective win. We're doing this for a collective win. It's not just for one company or one person or one industry, but actually really us as an entire um, as an entire movement, because we are all figuring out the future, <laughs> I mean, not just the future of work, but the future in its entirety, right? And having all of these pocket discussions and really deep dive in not only our successes and best practices, but the challenges so that we could all learn from one another is already a win in and of itself, right? Because people are coming together and there's that African proverb, right? If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And, and that is something that is really true in in what we have learned in determining this pathway. Now, JP, I know we've spoken a lot on the, you know, on the study and the industry as a whole and things that we've seen on a macro level, but I absolutely wanted to go back into the Capital One journey um, itself, right? And I know that they're, you know, having or being in a journey, right? Or this adventure, I'm sure there were a lot of things that you guys had to do and that you guys had to prepare for. So how did you guys, you know, arrive at this, um, you know, conversation with your associates that this is the transition that you guys wanted to do and have a long-term work at home setup? How was that journey for you guys? It ended up being incremental. So instead of this one watershed moment of going from where we're not work at home to, hey, everybody, guess what? We're now work at home. Um, we actually anchored to a set of principles and one of them being we want to be more transparent than ever with our, our approach and communication. And in order to get there, there were a couple of, I think, really powerful milestones in the journey that I think established the trust and then gave us the stage and platform to then provide ongoing updates with uh, increasing amount of, of confidence and trust in our message as well, too. So um, there's one story I like sharing where um, you know, we use uh, Slack communication as a lot of organizations do, and there's all sorts of channels. You can find all sorts of, of interesting content in any number of them. And um, there's one period where um, when we first started to say like, hey, I think it's time to revisit our strategy and, and this work at home component, I think is a must. Um, a lot of rumors started to swirl within the, the back alleyways of Slack itself. And um, some of our leadership team surfaced some of the rumors and, and half of the rumors were actually facts with really specific data that I was quite frankly kind of impressed that, that people had. And the other half was just, I think, very fictional. Uh, and, you know, I think in a lot of organizations and with no judgment passed, you know, the, the instinct might be to immediately like, you know, just, just eliminate the, the rumor channel and, and maybe help remind individuals why that's not a good thing to do and avoid rumors and speculation. Um, we took a different approach and I think it was the right approach, which was we said, no, embrace those. Uh, people are speculating because they don't know. And this is a, a topic of passion and, and priority for them. And let's make it safe for them to, instead of having to, you know, gossip with each other in, you know, the shadows, let's make sure that they feel empowered to actually have the discussions and bring the questions to us. So I can remember in one of our internal communications where we do videos, we call it, you know, a little bit of a campfire side chat with our leadership team. Um, you know, we actually said, hey, there's a lot of rumors that we're seeing in Slack. We're going to read through each one of the rumors and we're going to tell you if you're right or wrong, uh, fact or fiction. So we had fun with it. And it, and it was a, a powerful moment to be able to say, hey, you said that we have, you know, purchased this many laptops in order to go to work at home. Um, fact or fiction? Well, I mean, fact, we did actually purchase those, although it wasn't originally for work at home. It was for this reason. And now we actually do think they'll enable work at home. So that conversation, I think, was really powerful because it showed everybody, hey, we like, don't be afraid to ask the questions. You care. And if, if it's important enough for you to be having these discussions, then as leaders, we have a, an obligation and responsibility to, to prioritize the right responses and addressing those. And so, you know, I think through that, we 
we knew that the moment we let the cat out of the bag and to say that we're even at the beginning of that journey, that individuals would want updates early and often, which again is, I think, consummate with any leadership role and responsibility. So we were happy to do that. And then I think from there, you would see almost weekly touch points and updates on what was taking place, seeking the, the questions that individuals have and pulling them in to make sure that we weren't, again, trying to come up with the answer in our own head, but seeking outside of ourselves to know what was really on people's minds and bringing along all of our employees throughout the journey as well, too. So that, I think, was was really critical. And I think um, it allowed for, I think, a healthier transition and assimilation. And it also, in turn, provided us the opportunity for this never-ending stream of feedback, questions, and concerns that we could then go back and, and test ourselves. And if we didn't have a good answer, then that was a great indication that there's there's more work to be done in whatever space it may be as well. Absolutely. I love the campfire um, uh, fact or fiction side chats with, with the leadership because aside from the open communication, um, JP, I think it was also making them feel empowered, but also creating that safe space where people could talk. And I think that that was what was so important. You know, one of the things that we also learned during the pandemic was there was just really a need for all of us to connect. And having these honest, transparent, and also very, um, you know, straightforward conversations. It's a beautiful way to connect with our team. And I could hear from your story that the feedback that they were also providing, whether it was from the rumor chat group or during the discussion, right, was also a great way for you to see what was the pulse. And then you could actually also create all of these amazing opportunities and initiatives that could go back into building this new transition. Fantastic. I absolutely love that fact and fiction. So on that note, um, JP, as I, I could hear that, you know, you you already shared it. There was a lot of touch points and milestones that you guys um, went into it. I, my question now ha is, how has the work at home setup been for you and your team's productivity now that you have transitioned into it and you've seen the magic around it? How has it been for um, the productivity? Yeah, that's been one of the many pleasant, I think, outcomes of all of this is it's been by and large incredibly beneficial and however you measure that. So for one, we see absenteeism is performing at all time best. And that's not a surprise. I think when you, you know, it can be a challenge um, when you add a 45 minute to an hour and a half commute on both sides into and out of the office and the, just the level of effort to come in, the, the game has changed when you have the option to do that on site or in the comfort of your own home as well too. But there's more ways than just absenteeism that we measure productivity. And I think in each one of those measurements, we've found across the board, we've either returned to pre-pandemic normals or now um, like redefining what the best looks like and, and continuing to, to see what, you know, all time highs in performance or favorable performance looks like as well too. So I've been really pleased with, with how it, it shows up in, in the areas that impact our, our customers directly and our frontline associates, which is the majority of our operation. But then also, I think, you know, even at more senior levels, and I think throughout, you're seeing this ability to, to I think, invest in greater um, ways than ever before. Like, I'll speak for myself now to say that the setup that I have before me right now is, is highly customized and, and, and very different than what my, my workspace may have been looking like in the years prior. Um, and when I say customized, it's not just the, the monitors I have and the placement and the right height and all of that. But there's other creature comforts here too. And you know, the pictures and the art of my children um, that also provide some relief. And even the, the comfort that comes from my, my dog, my Yorkshire Terrier coming in every once in a while to sit near me that all of a sudden always has a, a beneficial impact on my productivity as well too. So there's certainly very measurable ways that we know our productivity has, has forever been transformed for the better. But there's also all these intangibles too that we're hearing and seeing at all levels of, of productivity just being um, unleashed and unlocked at, at new potential and scale. I love that, the intangibles, because the intangibles, JP, were the things that we could not even talk about before because we did not have any visibility on those intangibles, right? And we could not have until we took that leap and went into this setup, right? And now we see all of the, the benefits, but also the little things that could help us with our productivity, but we didn't know we could access it before, right? Absolutely. And I'll even add too, like you're spot on, Bea. And when we talk about enabling productivity, you know, again, a lot of the times we talk about the future of work and work at home is kind of like the, the star on the stage. Um, but the cast is more diverse than just work at home. And I think the real future of work is one about optionality and work at home is just one of those options because we've also seen examples and we, we track the number of individuals who choose 
to go into the office when they could be at home on any given month. And we found over time, while not a dramatic increase, it's been gradually increasing. And now it's, I think, plateaued a little bit. And we've seen more individuals start to say, you know, hey, I think I'm going to go into the office this day or for a couple of days. And when we peel back the layers to understand why, great example is in this wonderful workspace I have, when I have my family visit, I know that um, they are, you think I'm excited and have a lot of energy, they'll have to meet them. And I'm actually the even keel one of the group. So I may know that, hey, I'd like to go into the office for the next two days to make sure that I can be more focused than I would be if I were entertaining my nieces and nephews um, in the, the home space as well, too. So there's this beautiful choice that people can make to enable whatever it is that, that sets them up for the ultimate success and, and most productive days. That's awesome. And I think that everybody just wants to have that choice. You know, just having that choice is empowering already. And JP, you know, all I could think about as you were sharing the cast of characters, I mean, could you imagine if there was a Broadway show on the future of work and how awesome that would be to like see different characters play it out and, you know, how they would like, you know, just to see the sentiment of the audience as well, right? Which of those characters they would be going for. And on that note, actually, I was thinking about it. If we were talking about the cast of characters and the roles these options and choices have to play in our life and in our businesses, what would be the role of the building? I'm just going back to what you were sharing earlier, that those were the questions that you had now. So given um, your own experience, JP, or Capital One Philippines, what would be the role of the building now that we have these choices or options? Yeah, I, you know, I'm really eager to, to find what the definitive answer is, but I think there's a, a couple of, I think, um, low-risk guesses that I'll, I'll make as well, too, and then what we're already seeing. And it's I say low risk because we're hearing it from feedback as well, too. And it was a part of our McKinsey study. And we're still asking um, a couple of things have emerged in, in what individuals want the role of the building to be going forward. Um, one we touched on already, which is like this reverse business continuity. Um, it, you know, we looked at work at home as a, a play for resilience, which absolutely is, you know, hey, the, the pandemic has hit. We're able to maintain our, our production and operation. Um, you know, with less disruption as a result of this. But then there may be times where you may have localized power outages, as an example, due to a natural disaster or event. And, and, and knowing that they can quickly come into the building and comfortably um, perform without any disruption is great. Or even if it's because of, of personal life events where, you know, it just makes sense to be on site for a couple of extra days as well, too. So that was clear. But I think even more so, um, our associates uh, have shared that they want it to be a, a facilitator of connectivity again. So there's there's no replacing the desire for connection. I think at times we over-index the, the role that the walls play versus I think it has more to do with people, personality, and purpose than it does the place itself. But that doesn't mean that when individuals do come into the building, there aren't things we can do to help them maximize the opportunity that they have to interact. And so we're going through the process right now of, of working with individuals to figure out how do we re, redesign our, our existing real estate to, to do just that, to allow individuals to maximize their time together. And I think there's a lot of really exciting creative solutions to do that as well, too. So I think that the, the ability for the, the, the role, if we're going to be a character in this wonderful play that now I'm super interested in as well, too, but I will audition as long as there's no singing required, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I think that the role of, of being able to provide continuity when needed at the optionality, as we talked about, coupled with an enabler of, of, of interactions, but not being the only place, but just one great option that they have to connect, I think will be a, a star role for, for that building in the future. Absolutely. Now I'm excited to see how that character um, you know, portrayal will pan out, JP. I do have one last question on, you know, just hinging on that play or that Broadway, right? Of, of the roles that we play. What role now do you feel work-life balance or work-life integration? I think you touched on that earlier, would play now, again, going back to the choices that we have and the options that we are um, sharing with our teams today. Yeah, I think it's the role it, it has already had is it's redefined expectations. And I think appropriately so. Um, I can remember uh, someone we worked with referred to me as a future of work evangelist because I get so passionate about this, this topic in particular. And and, you know, I'm fascinated when you look at all of the transformative, um, you know, revolutions of industry and, and economies over time and, and what role it has had for, for better and worse. And with all the goodness that came with, like, as an example, take the Industrial Revolution as well, too, and, and just what that did for production. 
one of the downsides is all of a sudden it, it required a lot of folks in the rural areas and provinces and, and other communities that are a little bit further out to, to kind of centralize around the location of work itself. And with that comes other challenges, rising prices and you know, limited options and, and where you live and, and, and all of that. And so, you know, now I think what we've seen is individuals can thrive under you know certain circumstances, and I think very specific to depending on the roles themselves, but they can thrive, be productive, and at the same time, while increasing the productivity and impact they have as employees, all of a sudden get to see their children more, get to eat better as well too, because you you know maybe are able to reheat the the leftovers that you made you know over the weekend a little bit more quickly, and just even able to get the extra sleep. I know I've heard the extremes of individuals who have three hour commutes even as well too, and. Just imagine six hours a day back, what do you do with that time? And many are investing it in themselves and their wellness and, and having an exercise routine. And, and I know for me, you know, I've, I've got a 13-year-old and now a two-year-old as well, too. And, and it's a night and day difference between the, the, the time I get to see my, my two-year-old, you know, growing up that I didn't necessarily have when I was working the more traditional, you know, office routine, you know, nine to five and, and some change back in the day as well, too. So that's something that I don't think you can ever put back in the box. I know it was born of urgency and, and the pandemic and the concerns for our well-being and health. But I think along the way, we found that there's other benefits and priorities that will and already have forever change what the expectations are of the labor market, which is why, again, I think that next chapter I talk about the Great Divide, those who, who figure that out first are going to really reap the benefits of, of having access to some incredible and deserving talent. That's awesome. Thank you so much, JP. You know, one of the things that I absolutely loved hearing in all of the Zoom calls and all of the virtual calls that we have when it when we actually end earlier than expected is, hey, let me give you back the gift of time. And it hits me always at a different level because time is such a gift. And you're right, we can't put that back into a box. It's the time that we have now and having these options, like what you shared, allows us to actually be able to make that empowered choice what to do with the time that you have and still be empowered and productive at work. JP, this has been such an amazing conversation, by the way, and I feel that if you and I had more time, we would probably already be writing the script of our new Broadway show, right? But alternatively, what I want to leave our listeners with would be your own food for thought when it comes to the pathways to the future of work and what it is that we are experiencing now. So JP, I'm going to give you a challenge after everything that we've said and the million other things that you're so passionate about being the future of work evangelist that you are. If there was one thing that you could leave our listeners with that is a food for thought for the rest of the week or the rest of the month, what would it be? It, I would challenge everyone to ensure that as just a part of your DNA, as a, as a leader, as an employee, as an individual, um, you know, ensure that the, the process of learning and seeking for answers outside of yourself remains a top priority. Uh, that's where all of the growth comes. I always share the quote, there's no comfort in the growth zone and there's no growth in the comfort zone. And so again, if we stick with what we know, that's very comfortable, but that's probably limiting our ability to grow. And so go out there and, and, and I'll, I'll share um, one of the more powerful images and visual analogies that I think I've, I've ever heard. And I'll encourage individuals to, and your listeners to, to look it up as well too, but it's, it's one that was brought into our leadership meeting that I, I probably look at once a month, which is, you know, if, if you look at the, the central park of Ohio State University, one of the largest universities in the US, take a look at their, their, their campus community park that they have. And what you'll notice is they have this really uniquely shaped um, combination of sidewalks. Most of the time you look at sidewalks, they're very symmetrical. They have right angles. They're very straight. This one looks like a, um, a, a wonky asterisk, if you will, and with sidewalks kind of falling in different areas. And, it, and I remember um, hearing about this even in prior life um, and asking someone like, how did you end up with such a weird setup? Were they paying attention? Did they not have blueprints? Um, we use that visual analogy, I think, earlier when I talked about our commitment to learning. And the story goes that Prior to laying down the actual concrete for the sidewalk itself, they allowed a couple semesters to go by and they wanted the students instead to just walk wherever they wanted to go to from wherever they were coming from as well too. And over time, what inevitably happened is the grass that they walked on the most became their own pathways of, of maybe some just dirt and dead grass as well too. And, and ultimately what happened is they were able to see exactly where those that they served, the students, 
wanted to, to be and where they wanted to go to get to where they wanted to be as well, too. And that's where they ultimately laid the, the foundation, the, the, the concrete for the sidewalk, the pathway into the future for those folks. And so I think there's a lot of uh, parallels that we can all leverage as leaders. So keep an open mind, look, understand who you serve and make sure that you're taking into account their needs, their desires, where they're coming from and where they want to be as well. JP, what a powerful visual. I can't wait to check it out myself, but I think that that's just a beautiful, not only food for thought, but a spread for thought, right? That we want our listeners to really reflect on and take a look at as we carve out, like what you said, allow us to actually make the way for what it is our future of work is going to look like. And if I could just wrap it all up, and I, you know, it's really challenging also for me to wrap this up, JP, because I feel like there's just so much more to talk about. I want to go back to the first thing that you said that really captured my um, attention and I really resonated with, with what you said on, let's pause on the building and really focus on the learning because in the focusing on learning, we get to write our own path. We get to experiment. We get to carve out our own adventure. We can even choose our own adventure and whatnot. We can learn from it. We can fail fast, but ultimately, whatever the pathway that we design, it makes sense to us. It matters to us. And more importantly, it is made by us for us. So thank you so much, JP, for such an enriching and invigorating conversation. I could feel the palpable energy and I am sending all of that good energy back to you and Capital One Philippines as you carve this beautiful pathway to the future of work. Thank you so much, JP. It's been a pleasure and uh, this didn't disappoint. Like I said, I was excited coming into it, more excited after the intro and dare I say, even more excited leaving today. So thank you for, for hosting me and, and what a great topic. Thank you very much, JP. And to our listeners, I don't know, maybe you will catch the next play or the Broadway on the future of work. And of course, the next chapter of what this future of work looks like. Thank you once again to all of our listeners for being part of another fresh serving of Breakfast to Business together with me, Bailim, your morning girl, and JP Paperman, Head of Operations of Capital One Philippines. Thank you so much. Have a great week and take care, everybody. Ciao. That's it for today's episode of B2B Breakfast to Business with your morning girl, Bea Lim. Please don't forget to tune in to Team Asia's social media accounts to keep yourself updated on these breakfast happenings. Remember to stay safe. See you again soon here at B2B Breakfast to Business. Thank you. Ciao. Breakfast to